Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to sing these songs, these truths, to remind our hearts of your greatness, your goodness, your glory, your kindness to us through your Son, the Lord Jesus. We pray, O oh God, as we open your word this morning, that you would be honored, that you would be honored by the condition of our hearts, that you would prepare our hearts in readiness to hear your word, heed your word, benefit from your word. God, we pray that a watching world would see us who love you, who are called by your name, to be different, to truly be submitted to your sovereignty and your goodness and your care, to have been transformed by your power from the inside out. And God, we pray that you would use your word to this end in our lives this morning, in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to imagine for a moment picking up the phone and dialing 911 in an emergency, in a time of need, and no one answers. And you call again and no one answers. What, what if no one ever answered 911? What if the criminals in your city knew that no one would ever answer a call to 911? Could you imagine what life would be like if there were no first responders, if there were no law enforcement? Could you imagine what it would be like if there were no defense department? If the bad actors of the world, the Qaddafis and the Ahmadinejads, could have whatever they wanted? If Hitlers could overrun every nation on the face of the earth? What would the world be like? What I want us to think about this morning from our text, we're going to be looking at Romans 13 and verse 4 in particular in our continuing study of the role of Christian in his relationship to government. What I want us to see first and foremost this morning from God's word is that government is a kind gift from the Lord to you. Human government, as bad as it may be, as corrupt as it may be, as varied as it may be throughout human history, human governments are a gift from the Lord to human society. We're going to see that in our text I want to look at Romans 13, 1 to 4, read all of those verses, and we're going to come back to our outline looking at those theological truths that undergird Christian submission to government. Let's look at this passage again, beginning in verse 1. Paul the Apostle writes, Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it, that is government, is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger, who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection. Of course, the point of this whole passage we've been looking at is that Christians must submit to governing authorities. Christians must submit to governing authorities. And we've been looking at the theology that Paul gives us here in this chapter to undergird our submission, to steal our nerves, as it were, to give us conviction about that submission to flawed human governance. The first theological truth we saw was in verse 1, that governing authorities are from God. We learn in verse 2, secondly, that resistance to governing authorities is opposition to God. We learn in verses 2 and 3 that opposition to governing authorities brings trouble. And now we come to this fourth theological truth here in verse 4 that will undergird our submission to governing authority. And this is a surprising one. The truth here in verse 4 that Paul gives us is that governing authorities are God's servants for your good. Governing authorities are actually God's servants for your good good. Look what Paul says here in verse 4. For it, that is government, authority, it is a minister of God to you for good. 
very simple statement. It's a shocking statement to our senses if, if we've been trained to despise human government. To be told from God's word that it is in fact a minister of God, and that it is a minister of God to you, and that it is a minister of God to you for good. These things can grate against our experiences. You know, let's look at this explanation piece by piece. The first word there in verse 4 is the word for. This is explanatory. It is telling us why we should behave in accordance with government expectations. Why we should not be in rebellion against government. And the reason given here in verse 4 is that government is God's servant. Literally, Paul says govern, government is a minister of God. And the word he uses for minister here is the word we are familiar with, deacon. Government is God's deacon. That is a servant role for administrative capacity. It is the same word that we find for service in the church. That official office of deacon in the church has this same word. Now, that doesn't mean that government officials are rendering religious service, nor does it mean that they're qualified by their government role to lead or to direct in the church in spiritual matters. But it does mean that they are doing God's business in the world. God's servant here, a minister, a, a deacon of God, that is what God himself calls human government. And we speak of government officials as public servants, right? We expect them to be exactly that, serving for the benefit of the public good. What does this mean for human governments? Well, first of all, to be told that governments are God's servants means that governments are not God. If you are God's servant, that means by definition you are not God. You are not in the place of God. You do not have the intrinsic authority of God. To be a servant of someone is to not be that someone, but to be under that someone. And government is to be under God as God's servant. And those governments in human history that have elevated themselves to the place of God are in serious danger. Think about the German government in the 1930s, filled with uh, vile uh, oppression of people, filled with a nationalistic fervor to undo the Treaty of Versailles imposed at the end of World War I, the German people began to fall under the rapturous claims of the Third Reich, led by Adolf Hitler. It was said in 1941 that Hitler's Nazi regime and Christianity were absolutely incompatible. But the German church went to sleep, and I think the German people were infatuated with a rise to prosperity, a rise to a new nationalism, and they overlooked some severe warning signs. But what I want to put in front of us right now, just by way of illustration, is the German attempt to replace the church with the Reich. The National Reich Church, as it was called, issued a 30-point program for worship. And the goal was very clear. The desire was to do away with biblical Christianity. The desire was do, to do away with any reference to the one true God and replace it with a Germanic pagan ideal of deity, specifically the deity located in the Nazi party. So they gave a 30-point directive for the National Reich Church. Uh, number one, the National Reich Church of Germany categorically claims the exclusive right in the exclusive power to control all churches within the borders of the Reich. It declares these to be national churches of the German Reich. Point number five, I, I'm not going to read all 30 of these, I'll pick a few. Point number five, the national church is determined to exterminate irrevocably the strange and foreign Christian faiths imported into Germany in the ill-omened year 800. Point number seven, the national church has no scribes, no pastors, no chaplains, no priests, but national Reich orators are to speak in them. Point number 13, the national church demands immediate cessation of the publishing and dissemination of the Bible in Germany. Point number 14, the national church declares that to it, and therefore to the German nation, 
it has been decided that the Führer's Mein Kampf is the greatest of all documents. It not only contains the greatest, but it embodies the purest and truest, truest ethics for the present and future life of our nation. Nobody's allowed to read the Bible. Everybody has to read Hitler's sort of autobiographical tirade. Port number 18. The National Church will clear away from its altars all crosses, Bibles, and pictures of saints. Point 19. On the altars, there must be nothing but Mein Kampf to the German nation and therefore to God, the most sacred book. And to the left of the altar, a sword. And then point number 30. On the day of its foundation, the Christian cross must be removed from all churches, cathedrals, and chapels, and it must be superseded by the only unconquerable symbol, the swastika. That is a terrifying set of principles. Terrifying in the sense that as God's servant, uh, one holding delegated authority, the government is not to take the place of God. And, and clearly in the Third Reich in Nazi Germany in the 1930s, the government set out to do exactly that. But every government official must remember that the authority that a government has is a delegated authority. Deuteronomy 17 makes it clear for this for Israel. When you enter the land... Deuteronomy 17, 14 to 15, which Yahweh your God will give you, and you possess it and live in it, and you say, I will set a king over me like all the nations who are around me. You shall surely set a king over you whom Yahweh your God chooses. That is, God is truly the king. God is truly the sovereign, even over the rulers that Israel would have. David knew this. He expressed this in 2 Samuel 7. Therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says Yahweh of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people Israel. Now, therefore, as Yahweh lives, who has established me, says David, and set me on the throne, uh, he has made me a house as he promised. Isaiah 37:16 says this, O Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, who is enthroned above the cherubim, you are God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. The good kings in Israel knew that their authority was delegated. And then you have pagan kings recorded in the Bible who also recognized that their authority was delegated. Though they ruled over the world's empires, they said with Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 4, or Darius in Daniel 6, or Cyrus in 2 Chronicles 36, or Artaxerxes in Ezra 7, that Yahweh God alone was king, and that he had established their kingdoms on the earth. We talk about a king on the earth as being a sovereign. And the word sovereign just means you can do whatever you want. Was there ever truly a sovereign in the realm of man? No, of course not. God is the one who has always turned the heart of the king like channels of water. All human authority is delegated authority. No king was ever an absolute monarch, and their delegated authority is temporary. Every human ruler who has ever existed is on God's leash. And whether they recognize it or not, earthly authorities are deserving of our respect for the position that they hold as a ministry of God in the world. That is what Romans 13.4 is telling us. Government is a minister of God to humanity, to you, Christian, for good. But being servants of God implies their accountability to God. Every earthly king, every magistrate, every elected official, every civil servant will one day give an account to God for the execution of his ministry. I want you to turn to Luke chapter 12, and I want you to see how God himself feels about the execution of this delegated authority. How have God's stewards on the earth done what God has given them to do? How have they used their time, their resources, their abilities, their position? And specifically, according to Jesus' parable in Luke 12, how have they exercised authority over others? Listen to what Jesus said, and Jesus here is answering Peter's question, are you addressing these parables to us? 
or to everyone else as well. And the Lord Jesus said, who then is the faithful and sensible steward? And so Jesus expands this conversation he's having with the disciples to everyone who will listen. Jesus says, who is the faithful, faithful and sensible steward whom his master will put in charge of his servants to give them their rations at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you that he will put him in charge of all of his possessions. But if that slave, speaking of the one in authority, if that slave begins to beat the slaves and and says in his heart, my master will be a long time in coming and to eat and to drink and to get drunk. The master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him at an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. And that slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his will will receive many lashes. The one who did not know of it committed deeds worthy of a flogging will receive fewer. From everyone who has been given much, much will be required. And to whom they entrusted much, of him they will ask all the more. There's a really important principle here in this story that Jesus tells. Those who have been given a stewardship will be held accountable for that stewardship. Those who have been given authority over people are held accountable for the way they treat people. Every governing authority, every civil servant ought to be asked these questions in their lifetime so that they're prepared for the next. Did I serve God for the good of the people? Did I deter and punish crime? Did I seek the welfare of the people I was supposed to serve? Did I protect the innocent? Listen to God's indictments through his prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah, against human rulers. From Isaiah 10, Woe to those who enact evil statutes, and to those who constantly record unjust decisions, so as to deprive the needy of justice, and rob the poor of my people of their rights, so that widows may be their spoil, and that they may plunder the orphans. And from Jeremiah 22, 13 to 17, God writes this to kings, Woe to him who builds his house without righteousness, and his upper rooms without justice, who uses his neighbor's services without pay, and does not give him his wages, who says, I will build myself a roomy house with spacious upper rooms, and cut out its windows, paneling it with cedar and painting it bright red. Do you become a king because you are competing in cedar? Did not your father eat and drink and do justice and righteousness? Then it was well with him. He pled the cause of the afflicted and needy. Then it was well. Is not that what it means to know me, declares Yahweh? But your eyes and your heart are intent only upon your own dishonest gain and on shedding innocent blood and on practicing oppression and extortion. Here it is clear that God intends to hold accountable those who are in places of earthly authority. I shudder to think of the blood on the hands of civil servants in this country who have regarded the murder of untold millions of unborn children as a right to be protected. Those who get elected promising to defend that so-called right and those who have enacted unjust laws. I believe that believers, Christians, who are reading their Bibles have a better understanding of the role of civil servants than the people who hold government office. So it is right for us to pray for them, to pray that they would execute their ministries in a way that glorifies God and actually serves people well. Believers also have a clearer understanding of what unfaithful stewards will face when they are held to account for their stewardship. Far be it from Christians to make civil servants' jobs harder. Except where it comes to obedience to Christ, you and I ought not to be a burr in the saddle of those whose jobs come with such exacting oversight. They are raised up by God, established by God, ordained by God. They will be accountable to God for every decision, for every act of oppression, 
human governments truly are doing God's work in the world. And since they are doing God's work, we must revere them appropriately. And since they are doing God's work, they are to be held accountable by God for doing it faithfully. Notice what Paul says about this ministry of God. It is to you. This is a ministry of God to you, Romans 13, 4. That is, God has established government and provided its benefits to you, believer, and to every person on the face of the earth. And government officials may not view themselves this way. In fact, they most often do not view themselves this way. They might be in it for personal interest, maybe for their own prestige or personal power. Some civil servants may have a misguided and sophomoric attempt at making the world a better place in their own minds. Perhaps they're there to skim the public treasury or to line their pockets and help their friends. But in the end, it is clear for whatever motives the human governments might have, it is intended by God to be a service to you, to all of us. And notice Paul says it is a minister of God to you for good. For good. I'll think about a couple of agencies uh, that are part of God's government in our lives, ADOT, the Arizona Department of Transportation. They're responsible for that new extension of the 202 freeway just south of South Mountain. Currently, it takes me 40 minutes to get from my house to State Farm Stadium, where the Cardinals play. It is such a beautiful drive to be able to use that 202 extension and uh, go around all of the traffic that would normally take me through Phoenix and the downtown area on brand new pavement and a scenic drive. 40 minutes is a great thing. 22 miles cost $973 million. That's a lot of money for 22 miles of new pavement. I could never afford $973 million. And for the few times that I might drive the South 202, I could never make that worth my while. And yet the Arizona Department of Transportation has decided that we would all pitch in and the government would oversee that that new freeway goes in. Think about the FDA, Food and Drug Administration. Their job is to work to make sure that the food we eat and the medicines we take are safe. Now, these two agencies, ADOT and the FDA, are they inefficient? Do they make bad calls? Might there be corruption within the ranks? Do political connections award contracts to shady builders? Do political agendas interfere with the ideal of making our food safe? Yes, 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 and yes. Of course, all of those things are true. This is government. But in my opinion, a 40-minute drive on a new smooth payment, pavement is probably better than days of hiking, horseback, or a wagon train across the desert. And a bloated oversight bureaucracy is probably better than an unaccountable army of traveling snake oil salesmen peddling phony remedies to suffering people. Does the Food and Drug Administration serve us for our good? Yes. Does ADOT serve us for our good? Yes. Some would complain, but at what cost? But the underlying principle here in all of this is that government is one of God's good gifts to sinful humanity. And that's true for all authority structures. Authority structures are designed by God, established by God, ordained by God, and ultimately held accountable by God. But they are God's good gifts to sinful humanity. Students, how well would you learn without teachers? Are you self-motivated enough to get the information you need? Athletes, how hard would you work and how well would you play without your coaches? How safe would our neighborhoods be without law enforcement? How safe would our nations be without armies? Government, as God's institution, prevents the chaos and catastrophe that is in every human heart, just waiting to burst forth to become all that it could be. As a check to the full expression of our cumulative depravity, 
God's provision of human governance is truly a gift to us all. It only takes a few moments imagining what life would be like with no government to see how awful our world would be without it. So, thank a police officer. Thank a veteran. Thank a civil servant. Thank an elected official. As one of our own pastors serving as chaplain to Tempe Police Department has said many times to law enforcement officers, you are God's deacon doing God's work for our good. Thank you. That is an appropriate response from Romans 13.4. There is a fifth theological truth here in this passage that will help strengthen our resolve to submit to governing authorities. It is found in the second half of verse 4. Summarized this way, governing authorities possess God-given responsibility to punish. Governing authorities possess God-given responsibility to punish. Look how Paul says this. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For government does not bear the sword for nothing, for it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. The two basic functions of government are the defense of the realm and the stability of the populace. Every government must provide these two basic services or it will cease to exist. Governments may promise many more services beyond those things, but if you don't have a realm, you can't be a king. And if you don't have a source of revenue, you cannot survive as king. This is why even tyrants, even if only for the motive of self-preservation, must provide these two basic functions of government, social stability of some sort, and the protection of its citizenry from foreign threats. Without the means of production, without some form of commerce, there is no food, no standard of living, living, and no revenue. And so those in power cannot sustain their rule. Production struggles during chaos and cataclysm. If there are no people, there is no king. If there is no stability, there is no means of production. If there is no means of production, there is no revenue. If people don't have a stable enough society to live and work and eat and pay taxes, the government can't survive. And so if you're going to do something as a resident of a nation that upsets societal stability, you can incur the wrath of human government. This is what Paul refers to when he talks about bearing the sword in Romans 13, 4. And I want you to notice the last time this idea of a sword came up in Romans. A few pages back in Romans chapter 8, we read this, Romans 8.35, Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? And sword there is intended to mean lethality, death. Just as as it is written, Paul says in verse 36 of Romans 8, For your sake we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. The sword here is a reference to lethal activity. Uh, The government bears a sword, even lethal force. And it is presented here to induce fear for misbehavior. It doesn't mean that the government is required to induce capital punishment for every crime that's committed. But it does mean that governments can do that. And sometimes they do. And so the sword here is an emblem for all of that brute force authority that governments bear. If you do what is evil, that is, what the government considers to be wrong you incur the wrath against that misbehavior. And Paul says you should be afraid. Roman governance, the the very governance that Paul was under as he wrote this letter, the very governance that the readers of this letter were under, bore the sword. And it bore the sword effectively. The Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, uh, was pursued with great fervor. Rome knew that the empire would splinter if it could not keep the peace. 
And so the government's job was to protect the, the citizenry from evildoers without and to punish those evildoers within. Those who are within the realm doing evil are to be punished. There's a principle in Ecclesiastes 8.11 that when the sentence against a misdeed is not executed quickly, the hearts of men run further to do more evil. There's probably a commentary in there somewhere on our own justice system that with such delayed punishments, there is actually encouragement to do further evil. But the government's job is to punish evildoers, both inside and outside. It punishes those evildoers who desire to usurp the nation, to overrun the nation, and destroy the nation from outside. And the government's job is to punish those evildoers who would subvert societal stability on the inside. I believe the sword here includes capital punishment. By the way, this was something that God gave to human government all the way back in Romans 9, 6. This is after the flood. This is, of course, after the fall of man. And God maintains that man is still created in God's image. Therefore, whoever takes the life of man, his life shall be taken. So capital punishment was instituted for humanity even long before Mosaic law for Israel gave it. Have human governments ever misused the sword, abused the sword? Have they ever inappropriately used the sword on on their own citizens or even on foreign nations? Of course. Of course governments have done this. What Paul says here is not that they bear the sword only when they do it right. It is simply an observation that governments bear a sword. And so if you misbehave in their eyes, you need to be afraid. And Paul says the human government does not bear the sword for nothing, or it does not bear the sword in vain. That means that governments will wield punishments when they want to, against people who do things they don't like. And it will very often be effective. If you don't want to pay your taxes, well, the IRS has a sword. Not a lethal one, but you can lose your job, you can lose your earnings, and you can lose your freedom. Just ask Spiro Agnew, Willie Nelson, and Al Capone. You can complain all you want that taxes are not debts, that income tax is confiscatory, and that the redistribution of wealth is unconstitutional. You can say that. You can protest that. You can refuse to turn in your taxes. You can sit on your money on April 15th all you want, but you just might find yourself writing even sadder songs just to pay your debts. You might complain that SEC rules about insider trading are unfair. But like Martha Stewart, you may just end up dreaming up recipes behind bars. Governments have the power to enforce their definitions of good and bad behavior. So Christian, be careful of your company. Not just what you do, but even who you, who you associate with may rope you in with subversives and you could suffer for it. There's a very real principle for us that we not be unequally yoked, that is, linked together, even in causes, with those whose primary loyalty is not to Christ. There is a danger for us in that. There's a danger for us, number one, in that our message might be lost when we link arms with people who do not share the priority of our message. But there's also a danger in linking arms with those who are not willing to submit to government out of love for Christ, and we link with their causes. We may suffer just for the association. The only time I've ever been in the backseat of a police car was my senior year in high school at a midnight showing of a movie at a theater where a large brawl broke out between two rival factions of my high school, and weapons were present, and lots of people ended up in the backseats of police cars, we didn't have cell phones, and so our parents were all worried why we weren't home in the middle of the night. And because I had chosen to be close to the scene and affiliated with people who were not behaving wisely, I got roped in. The Christians ought to be careful about those associations. Again, what's at stake in verse 5 when we get down to these motivations we'll touch on next week is, 
it is necessary for us to be in subjection, not just because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. That is, before a watching world, that's the wrath of the state and all the consequences that come with that, including our reputation as believers, but also because of what is right before God, we must be in subjection. There's a really important principle here in verse 13, or in verse 4 of chapter 13, in that the human authority bears the sword. Human governments bear the sword. That is, secular governments bear the sword. It is not for the church to bear the sword. And so the things like the medieval crusades were sin. It is not for the church to take up arms and go conquer kingdoms that worship a false god, that that carry on a false religion, or to right the wrongs in the world. The Spanish Inquisitions, where the the established church in Spain sought to root out heresy by killing everybody that didn't believe what the church taught. In fact, in America, we love the separation of church and state. This is a good thing. It was a novel idea in the American experiment. Europe, for all of its history in the era of church history, really since the 300s had joined, had fused together the church and the state so that the the sword of the state was also the Matthew 18 process of the church. Excommunication became death or exile. How else do you remove somebody from the church if the church and the state are the same thing? Thankfully, some of the early reformers began to see the, the differences there, that there, are, there should be two swords. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, is the sword the church bears. And the sword of enforcement for good behavior and bad behavior is the sword that the state bears. And those need to be separate. It's a good thing when those are separate. And notice verse 4 Government does not bear the sword for nothing. Why? For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the evildoer. This is an important function of human government, to be an avenger. As a servant of God, the the secular governments, the, the human institutions of governing authority, are called here an avenger who brings wrath. Now we saw this idea of vengeance in Romans 12, uh, just a few verses up the page. Notice what Paul said there. Remember, verse 19, Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. You and I are not to take revenge. You and I are not to take up the sword in our own hands, as it were, and get justice, not for ourselves, and not even for others. The government is to be an impersonal agent who avenges, who brings about God's wrath, mediating God's wrath through the institution of the human government, the sword, so that we do not take personal vengeance. We do not right wrongs in that way. There is to be no vigilante justice, where some... Batman character is above the law or outside the law, righting a wrong committed against someone else. That is a sin to take on a vigilante form of justice. God gave the sword to the state. That is, God took the sword out of the hands of the individual. And vengeance or vigilanteism are forbidden for the Christian. I do not believe God has removed the self-defense sword. That's a topic of another sermon. Here what's in view is the sword of retribution, either for yourself or for others. I love that in our court systems, the personification of justice, lady justice, is blindfolded. The idea there is that justice is to be impartial. Justice is to not have a personal interest at stake in carrying out justice. And any time you and I take the sword of justice into our own hands as individuals, rather than leaving it to the impersonal agency of the state, it is always mixed with self-interest or personal interest. 
God's avenger, God's avenging sword is the state. The avenger sword is to be picked up by these impersonal human agencies to carry out justice. And God's avenger sword, the state, is temporary, it's imperfect, and it's helpful. That is, it is a gift from God, an agent of God's wrath to protect citizens from internal and external threats. But the well-being of rulers depends on the well-being of the people. So again, even if driven by self-interest, rulers who bear the sword are a benefit to humanity. This sword-bearing aspect of government is God's work as well. Notice what Paul says in verse 4. It is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath. You and I ought to be thankful that government bears the sword. That government is actually doing God's work in the world by mediating God's authority, by mediating God's wrath against evil doing, even to the degree that it does it imperfectly, the institution of it is ordained by God. What does that mean for us? That means we express gratitude, respect, honor, submission. We pray. Again, men everywhere are to lift up holy hands without wrath and dissension. And we pray for those who are governing authorities. But what does it mean for those governing authorities? The implication for them from this text is they answer to God. They answer to God for their categories of right and wrong. Every government official who is called evil good and good evil will face the one author of all things, the creator and sustainer of all things, the one who gave them their role as an administration of his wrath and hold them accountable for their use or misuse of that stewardship. They will answer to God for thefts and murders and corruptions and idolatries carried on in the name of human government. William Tyndale is a hero. William Tyndale, of course, gave us the Bible in English. In many ways was responsible for congealing the English language in the form that we have it today. And you know that William Tyndale was hunted down by the governing authorities of England. He was an enemy of the state. Why? Because he wanted to put the word of God into the English language for the English people. And yet Tyndale had a robust understanding of Romans 13. Even while he was an enemy of the state, he said the following. And listen carefully to what Tyndale said. The king is in the room of God in this world. He that resists the king resists God. He that judges the king judges God. He is the minister of God to defend thee from a thousand inconveniences. Though the king be the greatest tyrant in the world, yet he is unto thee a great benefit of God. For it is better to pay the tenth than to lose all, and to suffer wrong of one man than to suffer the wrongs from every man. It is better to have a tyrant as a king than a shadow. For a tyrant, though he do wrong unto the good, yet he punishes evil and makes all men obey him, he neither suffers any man to exact taxes but himself. A king that is soft as silk is much more grievous under the realm than a right tyrant. Read the Chronicles, and you will find it ever so. Let kings, if they would rather be Christians indeed, and not just so-called kings, so-called Christians, let these kings give themselves altogether to the well-being of their realms after the example of Jesus Christ remembering that the people are God's and not belonging to the king. Yea, they are Christ's inheritance bought with his own blood. The most despised person in his realm, if the king is a Christian, is equal with the king in the kingdom of God and of Christ. Let the king put off all pride and become a brother to the poorest of his subjects. What a great perspective. The Christian's responsibility is to submit to the king, honor the king, fear the king, not oppose the king. And the king's responsibility before God is to truly be God's servant and serve the welfare of the people. And each will be held, held accountable to God for how they fulfilled their roles. And of course, William Tyndale was 
betrayed and murdered, being hunted down by the king and the governing authorities, and dying, he prayed that God would open the king of England's eyes. And it wasn't very long after Tyndale's own death that not only did the Bible make it into the English language and circulate widely in England, but was actually mandated by the king to be placed in all the pulpits in all the churches in England. Tyndale's Lord, our Lord, the King of all kings, the Lord Jesus Christ, suffered unjustly at the hands of this very institution that he endorses. He suffered unjustly under the religious authorities in Jerusalem. He suffered unjustly under the Roman authorities in the Roman Empire. Jesus Christ truly is our example of what it means to humbly submit to unjust authority. And when Jesus, the king of all kings, who was mocked and beaten, they put a scarlet robe around him, they put a crown of thorns on his head, they put a reed in his hand like a makeshift scepter, and they mocked him and they said, Hail, king of the Jews. And the authorities put over his cross the king of the Jews as the crime that he had committed in mockery. And that one went to the cross to redeem sinners unto himself, so that every tyrant who would believe and surrender to the king of all kings would have all of his sins forgiven, and that every sinner, every rebel at heart, would have all of his crimes expunged from his record, removed, the scarlet made white as snow, our guilt removed as far from us as the east is from the west. What Jesus Christ did in submitting to unjust authority was singularly the greatest act of love and kindness and redemption and submission to the will of God that has ever been done. Jesus suffered more than any of us ever could, Jesus endured more injustice than any of us ever could at the hands of unjust rulers. You see, every single one of us deserves punishment. We deserve far worse than we could ever get on this earth. We deserve far worse than any petty human government could mete out towards us. Because of our crimes against God, we deserve eternal punishment in hell. And God has been kind to release us from our punishment by placing our punishment on the innocent one, the Lord Jesus Christ, to bring us to himself. You and I have every incentive to follow our Lord, to trust God's plan, to submit to human governments even when they're flawed, because our citizenship is in heaven, from whom we eagerly await the arrival of of the King of all kings, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is him whom we worship. It is him whom we adore. And it is for his sake that we obey these verses here. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we ask for strength. We ask for endurance. We ask for your help. That we might please you in our attitudes toward human governments. We know that there's not a king or a bureaucracy or a civil servant that has ever lived that has gone off your leash, outside of your sovereign control, outside of your good plan for your people. We entrust ourselves to you. You truly are our safety. And God, we pray that before a watching world, for the sake of the wrath of the state and the reputation that goes along with being submissive to governing authorities, for the sake of the gospel and the reputation of the church, but first and foremost in our obedience to you for conscience sake, we yield. We submit. We want to follow you. Give us aid to do this for your glory and our good, for the sake of the gospel going to the ends of the earth. It's in your precious name we pray.